Uh, welcome to this uh, first of two tutorials at CAF uh, this year. Uh, I especially welcome everybody since we have stiff competition, at least starting from two, uh, from uh, this uh, David Dill workshop. So it happens that David Dill is the academic grandfather of the uh, speaker for our first tutorial. Um, and so I'm very happy to have uh, Loris D'Antoni here with us today. Um, he's very well known in our community already, uh, given a uh, prolific writer that he is. Uh, but let me say a few words about him nonetheless. So he is, as you can all see, uh, on the faculty of uh, the University of Wisconsin in uh, Madison. He joined them only two years ago, so it's still relatively recent. And uh, in 2015, he graduated uh, with his uh, PhD from uh, UPenn uh, with uh, um, Rajiv Valour as his uh, PhD advisor. Uh, and it so happens that his PhD thesis uh, was about uh, programming using uh, automata and transducers. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. So you see the overlap with the title of the talk he's giving today. So he's definitely the person to talk about this topic. Um, beyond that, his uh, research interest is in uh, repair and synthesis uh, for programs. That's also a topic that's obviously very recurrent at uh, CAF this year. Uh, and he is also well known for his work in, in automating, um, giving feedback to uh, people who learn to program or learn how to work with automata. And he has this uh, automata tutor tool that he's uh, quite well known for. Okay, but uh, so today we're going to hear about um, symbolic automata and transducers, which is an extension of the classical model of automata. And I'll obviously let uh, Loris uh, speak to us about what this is and what it's not, what it can do, what it, con what it cannot do, and uh, what other open problems there might be in this area. Okay, Loris, thanks for being here. Thank you. Can, can I speak? Can I speak just in this mic, or I have to use this one? I guess I have to use this one. Okay. I don't think, oh, you can hear me, wonderful. Uh, hi, so hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Loris D'Antoni, as Tom said, thanks for the great introduction. Um, so uh, the goal of today's talk is to demystify these two models, symbolic automata and transducers, tell people what they are, what they can do, what they cannot do, and uh, hopefully you leave this room knowing what these models are useful for. Um, so. I'll talk essentially a, a bit about why do we need symbolic models, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll give definitions of these models and show you potential applications. And uh, really, the, the part I care most about is uh, that you see that they're useful in practice, and uh, you, you add them to your uh, uh, set of models you know about, and you can use them then hopefully in your next application. And there will be a bonus application with a video of me dancing. So, Today you will learn that you can use transducers to improve your dancing moves. So hopefully this is a useful talk. Um, so why do we need symbolic models, or where do classic automata models fall short? Um, I'm going to show you three applications that we kind of stumbled upon, and uh, uh, that it's actually the reason why we started studying these models. I, I have to say, most of the work that I present today was work that I did with Marcus Vanes, and um, in fact he will give a talk about this topic here at CAV. But uh, with Marcus, we were trying to verify, s to, to reason about several of these applications, and we, we basically we were always stuck because classic finite automata were not working. So the first application, which is actually surprising, is that of reasoning about regular expressions. So you all learn in your favorite automata theory course that you can prove properties of regular expressions using finite automata. And that's a bit of a lie. Because when you actually go and use real-world regular expressions, the alphabet is much more complicated than 0, 1, or ABC that you learn in your class. And uh, in fact, the alphabet is uh, this set of UTF characters, which is very complicated. It's actually even a structured alphabet in some sense. And it has lots of characters. And if you draw the finite automaton for any actual regular expressions, you will have a lot of transitions. So classic implementations do not scale. Moreover, when you actually use characters, like the, object, the, the, the character data structure or the character type in any programming language, these characters are not treated as elements from a finite alphabet. They are treated as bit vectors. So in some sense, the classic models are not aware of these, and they don't take advantage of this structure. Uh, the second application that I'll bring to your attention is that of HTML sanitizers. Uh, so 
few years ago, there was this paper where, they, they, I mean, people started basically thinking about whether we can verify sanitizers. And let me show you with an example where sanitizers are and why they're hard to reason about. So if, uh, if you are a cool kid 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, you would have had an account on this website called MySpace. Uh, and uh, MySpace basically was allowing its users to type HTML within comments. And uh, if you don't do anything about this, the HTML gets stored in the database that lives in the MySpace world. And when actually people open your comments, they will run the HTML that you typed. And this was bad. So this is, this is called a cross-site scripting attack. You're basically injecting executable code in the backend, and then people will run it. And you want to prevent this. So people uh, develop these tools called HTML sanitizers, which basically take some HTML that has untrusted input and turn it into a similar piece of HTML that doesn't contain bad stuff. So this is what the operation does. And here, the interesting thing is that like, one could say, oh, this seems like it's a tree transformation. I can use tree automata or some tree model. The issue is that these are trees of strings. So it's not a, a tree of ABCs, again, it's a tree of a complex structure alphabet. Um, the last application I want to show is actually, this is regular program analysis. You want to reason about some properties of programs that manipulate some data structure. So in this case, I have some list transformation. So I have a, a program that adds one to every element in a list, the list of integers, and then a program that removes the odd numbers from the list. And I want to check whether some composition of these programs always produces the empty list. And if you go and try to use uh, classic models for this, you cannot because the list operates over integers, so you, you're, you're stuck. So basically, what we have is that we have a finite automaton transducers, which are these models that people have studied for many years that operate great over small finite alphabets. But what we really need is basically something for infinite or even just large structure alphabets. And uh, uh, this essentially is the topic of this talk. And if you are planning to fall asleep for the rest uh, 80 minutes, uh, this is uh, like probably the only slide that you should remember from this talk. So automata and transducers are great models. They, they are very useful, a lot of applications, lot of, lots of great properties. And if somebody were to write a Yelp or a TripAdvisor review about them, we'll say, really cool model, recommended if you like finite alphabets. Uh, symbolic automata and transducers, they're also a foundational model. They work for arbitrary alphabets, also structure. And uh, they have great properties like the classic automata. But the novel thing, besides working for large alphabets, is that they essentially offer opportunities for completely reinventing automata theory in a way that is aware of this alphabet structure. And we will see, basically, that we can take classic algorithms and make them, make them much more interesting. So if you were to write a review about this, and uh, uh, you will write something like that. Best models have any long time, we'll tell all my friends. OK? So you see that there are more reviews, so it's because they're so much cooler that people are forgetting about the other one. So I, I told you now why we need models that can reason about complex alphabets, and let's see what these models look like. So symbolic automata, let's start by looking at what normal automata are. So you all recognize this. This is an automaton. It has a bunch of states, a bunch of transitions. And any part in this automaton that reaches the final state is a string accepted by the automaton. OK? So this is what the symbolic automaton looks like. So it's the same as a normal automaton. But now the labels of transitions are not concrete characters. They are predicates. And a character will cross a transition if it satisfies the predicate on that transition. The important part is that the predicates are a separate theory from the automaton. It's a, there is an alphabet theory which tells you what type of predicates you can have on transitions. Uh, so let's look at the semantics just to understand better. So if I pick this automaton, this automaton operates, accepts lists of integers. So things in n star, not sigma star. Okay? So the alphabet is infinite, but the representation is finite. Notice that I cannot accept this language using classic automata, because I will need infinitely many transitions. So I start in an initial state. I read the first symbol, 1. 1 is an odd number, so I trigger the, the self-loop transition. Then I need 2, and 2 is an even number, so I transition to the next state. 
and so on and so forth. The final state is accepting, so this sequence is accepted. So this symbolic automaton accepts all the list of integers ending with an odd number. OK? So what are examples of languages I can describe in this model? So I can describe the list of even numbers. I can describe the list that starts with a positive number and there's odd length. So this one uses the symbolic part to restrict the set of numbers. But then it uses the automaton part to enforce some constraint on the length of the string. I can use even more fancy theory, like I can use the, the theory of strings and describe, essentially describe strings of strings. So in this case, I can have some funny language. And uh, uh, one of the most useful applications is to use the theory of bit vectors to basically descri describe uh, sequences, so strings in the real world, so strings of characters. When I say characters, I mean a, C ca a character in the, in the C language or a character in the Java language, so l very large sets of characters. And this is another very important part of this talk, is what they, they cannot do. So there is often confusion when people think about symbolic automata. So symbolic automata, they are not like Turing machines. These predicates are used in a restricted fashion, and I will tell you how. But I cannot, for example, check that the first and the second element of a list are the same. There is no way to compare things at different positions. I cannot have that all elements are different. And I will show you some models that they can do some of these, but not the normal symbolic automata. Of course, uh, there is a model is only useful if we can use it for something. And uh, the, we should worry about whether these models actually have interesting properties that we can leverage to do our favorite static analysis or, or who knows what. So these are properties that you typically want from automata. You want closure under Boolean operations, decidable equivalence, and so on. And let me show you what happens when you try to take one of the classic property and transition it to the symbolic world. So let's try to do automata intersection. So by the way, I didn't say at any point, but like, please feel free to interrupt me before the, the end of the talk with questions. So if at any point you have something you don't understand or you want me to clarify, just come up to the mic and tell me or just shut out. Um, so I have these two automata. I'm just drawing two of their transitions, and I want to take their intersection. So we can do the uh, classic thing you do in Pinet Automata, which is the product construction. So I basically build a new automaton that kind of runs the two of them in parallel. OK? So in normal automata, wh what I will do is that if the, two automaton, if the two automata have the same symbol on a transition, the product automaton also trans has a transition on that symbol. So here we don't have symbols. In fact, we have two predicates. They don't, do they don't look alike. They are different predicates. So what we need to do is to do the intersection not only at the state level, but also at the alphabet level. So we will take the conjunction of these two predicates. Okay? So the two automata, to be synchronized, we need to synchronize the set of symbols on which they can move. And uh, uh, so this shows the first interesting property that we need to re retain the citability or retain interesting, pro interesting properties in the symbolic world. In particular, we want that our alphabet theory, so the set of predicates we can put on transitions, forms a Boolean algebra. So a Boolean algebra just means that you have a set, and that set is closed under Boolean operations. So I can take the, the conjunction and the complement of elements in that set and remain in the set. OK? Another thing you need to care about is, for example, you might want to check whether your automaton is empty. And to check whether an automaton is empty, you need to check whether there is a path in the automaton. So to do so, we need to make sure that the paths we create are still actual feasible paths. So we need to be able to check whether this predicate has become unsatisfiable, which is the case here. Okay, so we want to make sure that if this predicate is not satisfiable anymore, we throw it away. And this gives us the second requirement that we need on our alphabet theory, which is that the, al the, 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 the alphabet theory has to form a decidable Boolean algebra, not just any Boolean algebra. So it turns out that with these two conditions, that if you have a decidable Boolean algebra as an alphabet theory, so decidable Boolean algebra, again, it just means a bunch of predicates for which I can check satisfiability and I can compute Boolean combinations. But if you have these two properties, you can kind of redo classic automata theory in the symbolic world. So you don't lose anything. And um, 
And this is really cool because it creates this separation of concerns that was not kind of there in classic automata theory. So there is a complexity related to automata operations, which is how you model states, how you manip manipulate states. And there is the alphabet, which is treated somehow almost as a black box. It's just accessed basically through this Boolean algebra interface. So I have uh, these predicates, and I manipulate them, but separately, in my, it, it doesn't depend on what the Boolean algebra itself is. I just need this interface to operate with it. And for example, some Boolean algebras that have this property are linear integer arithmetic, bit vector arithmetic, and in general, really anything that you can write in an SMT solver. So SMT solvers are Boolean algebras with a lot of cool properties, but essentially that's how our implementation, for example, works. It interacts with an SMT solver to reason about the alphabet. Let me show you another example that uh, kind of, again, shows how these automata work in, in the symbolic setting. And this, this is determinization. So this is, again, a very classic operation you do for finite automata. And let's see how different it is for uh, symbolic automata. And let's say we want to determinize the automaton on the left. So we have, uh, uh, on one branch, we pick uh, even number. On the other branch, number divisible by 3. So this is non-deterministic, because if I give as input 0, I can go both on the left and on the right. So I will do the classic subset construction. So I say, initially, I'm in state P1. The, initial, the state consists only of P1. And now what happens is that I have to take multiple possibilities into account. So if I get a number that is even and divisible by 3, I will be in both state P1 and P2, Q1 and Q2. If I get a number that is even but is not divisible by 3, I will go to state Q1, and so on and so forth. So like in classic uh, subset construction, you get exponentially many states. But you also have this new thing that you can get exponentially many transitions. In the finite alphabet case, this, the number of transitions is bounded by the size of the alphabet. Here, the operations can generate new predicates that they weren't there to start with. So we get this all new thing that like, automata operations suddenly generate new predicates that I, I didn't have when I started. Another thing that this example shows is why we need a full Boolean algebra and not just intersection. So sometimes we need to be able to complement predicates to reason about the, the properties of the automata. So the reason I show determinization is because it's actually a very interesting, uh, it shows a very interesting operation that uh, is, uh, helps us relate how symbolic automata are similar to classic automata. And this is this idea of alphabet fin finitization. So even though the alphabet of an SFA, of a symbolic automaton, so from, from now on when you read SFA, it means a symbolic finite automaton, even though the alphabet is infinite, the way we treat it is finite. And by this I mean that my automaton ultimately has a finite set of predicates on each transition. And if I take the, all the satisfiable Boolean combinations of those predicates, I will get a set of equivalence classes in my alphabet that I can use to build a finite automaton that is essentially the same as the symbolic one. And let me clarify what this means. So first of all, let's look at what these satisfiable combinations are. So let's say I have these predicates in my original automaton, and the Boolean combinations are the predicates at the bottom. So these are, we, all, we will call them also the min terms. Uh, these are what they're called, for example, in Z3. So the idea here is that any string that I take that has some character in one of these predicates, if I change it to another character in the same predicate, that string, if it was accepted, it will stay accepted. If it was rejected, it will stay rejected. So essentially, the automaton cannot differentiate symbols in that predicate. Any two symbols in, in the same min term, they are equivalent for the automaton. They, it, it, the automaton cannot understand how, why they differ. So in fact, using this procedure, we can compile a symbolic automaton into a finite automaton, but at an exponential cost. So we have to take all these exponentially many combinations. And this is actually a, a nice property that, sh I mean, this is essentially what people in, people in the 80s actually already thought about kind of symbolic automata, and they, they understood this property. And they were like, oh, you know, it's all easy, because I can always compile a, a, an automaton with predicate to one without predicates. This is what you do in predicate abstraction. 
So for example, this is the hop cross algorithm for uh, automata minimization. And you see that it has this problem that it has a for loop over the sets of characters in the alphabet. Well, I can make it symbolic by just iterating over all the predicates that are in the set of satisfiable Boolean combinations. But this is its really ugly. Because if you notice, we started with an algorithm that was m log n, where m is the number of transitions and log n is the number of states. And now we have an algorithm that is 2 to the m log n. So having a model that causes exponential blow-ups whenever you want to use it is not a very useful model. What this shows as well, though, is that like actually SFAs are succinct. Because basically, we, we, we save a lot of space by grouping symbols in, in the same transition. So in fact, I'll, uh, I'll uh, now show you. The ones I show you up to now, they're kind of like, if, if you take a student giving this model, or give her this model, and say, come up with some properties, it's not too hard to come up with these properties. Like, if you think about it for a while, you, you will understand that these are the properties of this model. So the mo what made this model research worthy was actually understand how to avoid these pitfalls. So, and essentially, uh, after we started thinking about this, we, we, we started coming up with, whenever we, want, we were trying to use an algorithm, like the hop curve one I showed you, it was like, is it really necessary to compute all these satisfiable Boolean combinations, or we are missing something? So let me show you, for example, how this, this was a, a pop 14 paper we had where we showed that actually you didn't need the 2 to the m factor. You can do much better. So I'm not going to show you how Hopcroft's algorithm work, but I will show you the intuition of an important step of the algorithm and show you how it can be explained very elegantly in the symbolic setting. So the loop I showed you before essentially looks, so Hopcroft's algorithm maintains these sets of states that are supposedly equivalent. And the equivalent state can be collapsed to minimize the automaton. So at any point of the execution, this algorithm maintains these sets of states depicted in yellow. And it tries to find for states that should not be in the same set. So in this case, that for loop was looking for a character, A, on which two states in the same set have different behaviors. In particular, one of them goes to another equivalent set of set states, and the other one doesn't. So Hopcroft's algorithm essentially looks for all these symbols, and whenever it finds two of them, it uses them to split states further. So this is called partition refinement. And uh, for 40 years, people, I mean, this is the best algorithm for automata minimization. It's actually optimal. Uh, and when you want to make it symbolic, you have to go through this ugliness of the min term generation. But we actually, we found out that you didn't need to do so. And the idea is the following. Even though we don't have a finite set of characters we can iterate over, we can discover the same exact issue by just using is undecidable about this model. Uh, in fact, this half of the research about this paper started because of, of a wrong theorem I wrote in a submission that then started a sequence of four or five papers, including a journal one, where we actually understood how to fix everything. And uh, let me show you really one line proof of why this model is undecidable. Even the simplest property, which is intersection emptiness, which is essentially what you need to do model checking or an interesting question about programs, is undecidable. So what I can do in symbolic automata is I can have an alphabet like this one on the right-hand side, where basically each element is a tuple of integers, is three integers. And I can use these three integers to encode, respectively, the program counter and the two counter values of a two-counter machine. If I have a machine, that's the state of the machine. And now I can basically build a symbolic automaton, extended automaton, that like that, that checks whether the first configuration is the initial one of the machine, and then checks whether the next two by two configurations follow from each other. So that, that step function is basically a predicate that say, A, configuration two follow from configuration one. So this by itself is not enough, because it only checks that the, the second, the third configuration from, follows from the second, the fifth follows from the fourth, so it checks two by two. But we can build another automaton that checks that the, f the second follow for the first, the fourth from the third, and so on. And these two automata have an empty intersection if and only if the two-counter machine holds, non-empty intersection. So it's like a very simple model 
very restricted. Everything is deterministic. Look ahead at most two. Everything undecidable. So there are some properties that are decidable, but it's in general the interesting ones are not. So it turns out that for practical applications we were considering, these predicates were not appearing. And uh, so we came up with basically this, this restriction that like it turns out that if the predicates you have, the unary predicates, are actually expressible as conjunction of unary predicates, like the one on the right, then you're back to the, sim to the classic model, because you can, you can do exactly what we did for finite alphabets. We can basically split these predicates in, uh, into individual transitions and have a symbolic automaton. So even though this is easy, actually, this property is decidable. But this led actually Margus to uh, start thinking about a, a, a more general case of this. It's like, when can I take a predicate and turn it into a, a, a Boolean combination of unary, of unary predicates? And um, so then Margus wrote a very nice paper at CAV 15 that then turned into a JCM submission. And so this is another example of a, an automata problem on this in the symbolic world led to a completely different logic question of when are binary, unary predicates, when can you transform them in, into Boolean combinations of unary predicates? So anyway, lots of other properties. This is just supposed to give you kind of a, a little introduction to what's, what's interesting about symbolic automata. And then we studied, like, um, we, we have a learning algorithm this year at Takas. Uh, we have, uh, uh, with Marcus, we also had a way to compute forward by simulation for these models. And I will come back that, to that later. And um, we had actually uh, this year at MFPS an algorithm for checking fast equivalence of alternating automata. And perhaps the most interesting part, like if you really don't care about these algorithmic questions, is that there are two open source libraries that you can use off the shelf to use this symbolic automata. And uh, they are integrated with Z3. You can do lots of interesting stuff. In fact, uh, the reason why we have these libraries is because we try to, to do a lot of interesting stuff. So the first thing we, problem we worked on was for a long time we worked on this analysis of regular expressions. That was kind of what inspired this whole research. But then a lot of other applications came out. Like So we started using automata for solving monadic second order logic. Um, actually, recently, uh, Nikolai has started integrating symbolic automata to basically solve the theory of sequences in Z3. So you will hear a lot of talks on Friday about uh, string solvers. But w if you really want to do things modulo theory, the characters of the strings have to be also from another theory, and symbolic automata can help there. And, and then, actually, Jacobazzi and Della Preda, they, they had a couple of papers where they tried to use symbolic automata to reason about malware detection. But uh, this is not my work, but it's very interesting work other people have been doing. So let me show you one application that actually, this is what triggered the minimization algorithm. So we were trying to do random password generation. Where basically, this actually this came from the Microsoft product team. They went to Marcus, it's like, oh, we want a tool for uh, generate random passwords that satisfy some constraints. So this is like the classic stuff that when you go on, uh, on a web page, it says your password needs to contain one character, one letter, your who knows what, and uh, it has to have some length. And people, when they're given these constraints, it turns out that they, they become very dumb, and they write passwords that are very easily guessable. So it's good to have a tool that randomly generates them for them. And here, random is very important, because if the tool is not random, that the, can cause attacks. So the way to solve this problem is to build the automaton for these constraints, and then just do kind of Markov chain style sampling over it. And uh, I'm not going to show you the actual benchmarks for this, but the point was that existing tools were not working. Because finite automata, the alphabet was not working. Symbol uh, for normal symbolic automata, the classic minimizations algorithm were not working because we couldn't do the n log n we needed. And that's why we designed that algorithm I showed before. And these are other regular expressions we run it on just to show an idea. But like you can see that like there is orders of magnitude difference against classic minimization algorithms. So this, is, this was really a practical problem that led to a, a theoretical interesting algorithm. And here is really like the, this is log scale graph. So we are. 100 times faster than the other algorithms. And these are small benchmarks. For, for the benchmarks on password generation, actually, those algorithms don't terminate. So then we also had some other regular expression analysis work with this uh, alternating automata. I will not talk about it, but there is lots of work on basically using the fact that symbolic automata can represent bit vectors. 
So the second application, I mean, it's funny to call it an application, but it is uh, uh, that of solving Monadi second order logic. So Monadi second order logic is for strings is this logic where basically you have uh, existential, you, you have quanti quantifiers over positions in the string. So in this case, you can say there exist positions x and y such that x appears before y, x is labeled with an A, B is labeled with a B, and so on. And actually, this logic is equivalent to regular languages. This was Buki results from, the, from 1960. And uh, this logic is decidable because you can compile it into an automaton that uh, is equisatisfiable. And there is a tool called Mona for doing so. And Mona kind of, they were using symbolic automata, but not quite. And what we notice is that we could just take this logic and make it modulo theory. So we basically, we, we made the logic in which you accept sequences of, uh, uh, over any theory. In fact, it, it can be the, the predicates the atomic predicates could be Mona predicates themselves, but the point is that like, we build this solver that could use symbolic automata to basically uh, check satisfiability in this logic. And uh, again, notice that like the predicates appearing in the equi equivalent automaton, they don't appear necessarily in the original formula. So here you really need symbolic solving to kind of use the Boolean algebra properties. And the point is that despite this generality, despite we, we built a solver that could solve a, a much richer logic, we actually confer, co com we compare quite well with Mona, which was this really engineered tool that uh, uh, it was very surprising at the time because the satisfiability for the, this logic is uh, a tower of exponential. And uh, we could actually perform similarly to them on many benchmarks. And uh, actually it turns out that on some existential benchmarks we were doing better. So this was uh, thanks to our minimization algorithm that I presented before. Because the, the decision procedure for, for MSO uses a lot of minimization. And, uh, and then we could also solve predica uh, MSO predicates where we had this uh, modulo theory. Like in this case, this is like sequences of integers, actually integers and something else. And here, I what that point up there shows is that you could always, like I showed you at the beginning, translate any symbolic automaton into a finite automaton by finitizing the alphabet. But it really doesn't work. You can really, you can appreciate the exponential trend going on for doing that while not doing that results in much better running times. So the, the points at the bottom of the axis are our running time. The points at the top is what we will have to do to use existing solvers to solve this logic. Okay, so, so this is actually the part, that I, I, one of the part, I, are there any questions by the way up to this point? I'm, I've been talking for a while. Yes. Uh, it's, it's all uh, linear integer arithmetic. Uh, the question is like, what is decidable if the alphabet is linear integer arithmetic? And the answer is everything, because linear integer arithmetic form, forms a decidable Boolean algebra. So it's, it's uh, I mean, if you write a symbolic automaton, if you start comparing things at different positions, then that's not a symbolic automaton. Yes. It's, uh, it's, in fact, the symbolic automata library, the question is like whether it's connected already to the SMT solver. It's actually, it's better than that because the, the library uses an interface which is called Boolean algebra. And you can instantiate it with whatever you want. And one of the instantiation is, is a 50 line script to do uh, Z3 or to do whatever solver you want. In fact, you can have automata of automata because automata themselves are Boolean algebras. So it's uh, entirely modular, yeah. Yes. Symbols. So the question is, so for one of the examples I gave before is that all the symbol, the language where all the symbols are different in the automaton. So for finite alphabets, you can do that because you can just store all the symbols you've seen so far. So for symbolic automata, you cannot do that because if you store this, I mean, you can store a finite property of the symbols you've seen. So you can store, for example, that the symbol was greater than zero, but you cannot store the symbol itself. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't say that finite automata can store the symbols, but it's like more like they can check finite properties of the input. They have a regular look behind the input. And oh, if you add registers. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, th there are some technicalities. So I, yeah. Okay, I, I'll keep going. We, we can have more questions later. But this was good. Like, 
it, these are the type of things that uh, uh, people uh, are interested in. So uh, I, I want to show you actually some interesting open problems that I, I would like to actually, if some of you are interested, I think that these are very interesting problems that kind of emerge from this topic. So there are two types of problems. There are problems in the theory side, lots of problems in the theory side, and lots of problems in the practical side. So I'll start with the theory. So one of the things that I showed is that like in one case, we, we took a classic algorithm and we adapted it to the symbolic setting. And that wasn't easy, wasn't trivial to do. And uh, how do we do this for other algorithms? And I will show you that this is a problem, actually. This is not, not easy. And I will show you another thing, which is like, how do we develop a complexity analysis for this uh, symbolic automata algorithm? And I will show you what I mean by that. And then there are other problems that I put there, and I'm not going to discuss them. But it's like, this, there is a really a lot of opportunities for using these models in practice. So let me start, go back to my minimization algorithm. So Page and Tarjan showed actually that this, this same idea, uh, essentially what you're doing in this algorithm, you're computing forward by simulations for finite automata. If you don't know what they are, it's OK. But the point is that they are an interesting class of things you want to compute. And people have looked also about how to compute them for non-deterministic automata. In fact, you can still do it in m log n, where m is the number of transitions and n log n, n is the number of states. Our Popol paper showed how to obtain similar results for symbolic automata. So in, in particular, the, the algorithm on the right showed that you can do m log n something else. However, for the non-deterministic case, the best we could do was 2 to the m log n, like, or n, m squared. But we cannot do m log n like we did for the deterministic case. And this is really, like, we were really annoyed about this. Like, we, we, we thought about it for a while, and we still don't know how to do it, and we don't have a lower bound. But this shows a case in which, really, being symbolic is complicated. And it kind of goes back to Rupak's question, because this algorithm shares actually similar structure with another problem, which is the one for checking equivalence of unambiguous NFA. And both these algorithms require you to essentially count how many characters or how many strings there are of a certain kind. And the moment you have to do this, you have to use min terms. I mean, we don't know how to do it without. But there might be a way. We just don't know. So you basically, whenever you have to count something, this using predicates doesn't help you anymore because you have to start counting. So we don't know if that's the best you can do. Another interesting question that came from this paper was that like, we have, for example, for the deterministic case, we have two algorithms. One that is m square f of l. So l here is the size of the largest predicate in the automaton. And f of l is the cost of checking satisfiability in the theory for that predicate. So you have this parametric complexity where you have a trade-off between the state complexity and how many SAT query and how expensive those SAT queries are. And here, the two algorithms, they have different trade-offs. Like one achieves n log n complexity, but ask more expensive satisfiability, satisfiability queries. And the other one is worse in the states, but better in the satisfiability. In practice, the one on the right is much better. But again, we don't know if you can do best of both worlds. So this is, again, it's quite interesting that like, there is a new complexity theoretic question that we don't have in classic automata. All the structural results, they don't hold. So we, one interesting question is to understand these things. And uh, there are lots of tools, lots of libraries. So uh, I, I'm going to end again with this. But like, symbolic automata ap appear a lot in practice. So I'll now move to uh, the extension of automata with, with outputs called symbolic transducers. So why do we need transducers? So automata can assem essentially accept set of strings, so or set of least sequence sets in general, but they cannot describe input-output transformations. So transducers can describe things, for example, like uh, two, the function that takes a string and transforms every character in the corresponding uppercase character, or uh, the sanitizer I showed at the beginning. So anything that given an input produces an output. And uh, if you want to do, for example, the uppercase function in normal transducers, so this is what a normal transducer looks like. It's a finite state machine where you read a character and you output a string. And these strings are concatenated to form the final output. So here you will write something like this. But again, since the UTF set of characters is really large, you will need a lot of characters. Okay, too many transitions. So this doesn't work. 
a symbolic transducer, which is a symbolic automata automaton with output, does the same transformation with only two transitions. So the first transition checks if it's an alphabetic character, apply the corresponding offset to make it uppercase. If it's not an alphabetic character, output the identity. Okay? And let's look at the formal definition. So it's essentially, it's like a normal, it's like a normal a symbolic automaton. We have a predicate reading symbols, and uh, we also have a sequence of outputs, which are basically a bunch of functions that take the input we read and produce something. So in this case, whenever we read a number greater than five, we output that number plus one, followed by that number itself. So let's look at an example. Again, alphabet theory has to be decidable and so on. But let's look at this example. So we, we read this sequence. So one is smaller than six, so I output one minus four. Now six is greater than five, so I output six plus one and then six, so seven and six. And uh, two is even, so I output the constant five. And uh, three is, uh, is odd, so I output three minus one, three and three plus four. Okay, so this is the model. So I'm gonna assume that the alphabet theory is a decidable Boolean algebra like we said before. So that like any predicate in the alphabet theory is actually uh, closed under Boolean operations, the set of predicates. And I'll show you, so this is actually, the following three, four slides, they have nothing to do with the symbolic world. These are actually an interesting property that like, after a while you play with transducers, you, you understand. And it's like how powerful it is to have closure under composition. So closure under composition means that if I have two transducers, I can actually build an individual transducer that runs the compose function. So in this case, if I have the filter even and map C, whatever they are, I can actually compose them into an individual function, still representable as a transducer. And I can do this for more multiple times, so that's already interesting. But let me show you actually just with these, you can perform very interesting types of static analysis. So for example, you might be interested in computing the set of inputs that they can produce a certain set of outputs. So this is called the pre-image computation. So let's say I, I have this function, this function, like in the example we saw at the beginning of the slides, I'm interested in seeing what inputs can produce an empty list. So all I need to do to build this language is to basically create the language of empty list, which is a singleton language, and make the ident here I'm making the identity transducer only on that language. So it's a transducer that is only defined on the empty list and on the input outputs the empty list. So if I compose my original transducer with that transducer, I get my original transducer but only defined on the inputs for which I output the empty list. And if I take the domain of the transducer, now I have all the inputs that produce the empty list. So this was entirely just use closure under composition. So I didn't do anything fancy. And using this, you can now check properties like this one. You can basically do pre-post type of checking. Like here I'm asking, is it true that for any list, that function outputs an empty list? And I can do this by checking, take, take the non-empty list, now give me all the inputs on which this function outputs a non-empty list, and check whether this intersection with the one I care about is empty. So since composition is so important that lets us do pre-post condition, let's see how the closure under composition works. And this is actually a case in which it wasn't very hard to do it for symbolic transducers, but it really shows what closure under, co what composition of transducers is. So I have these two transducers, the one on the left and the one on the right, and I want to build their composition. So to build the composition, you basically need to feed the output of the first transducer as an input of the second transducer. And so to do so, first of all, you need to make sure that you only read symbols for which this is possible. So we are gonna start, we are synchronizing the states. So we are assuming we are essentially in state P1 for the first machine and Q1 for the second one. And we will keep this property that we run them in parallel. So now, of course, any symbol I read has to satisfy the transition of the first transducer. But I also have to double check that when I feed the, the output of the first transducer to the second one, the second one will actually accept it. So in this case, I have to check that phi one of f one of x is actually true. 
and similarly for phi 2 of f2 of x. Notice that I'm sending the outputs of the first one as input to the second one. And then the output is the same story. I have to, co I have to do function composition in the theory itself. So in this case, I'm outputting g1 of f1 of x. So this algorithm is very simple, but it really shows the essence of how the input is traveling across the two transducers. And actually, this showed a property that I kind of I didn't put in the slides, but basically, your theory has to be closed under substitution for this to work. So I showed you in the early slides, and this is, again, something that basically differentiates classic transducer from a symbolic transducer. I showed in the earlier slide that um, we were playing with the range and the domain of the transducer. So this is assuming that you can compute these, these languages. So in classic transducer, it's really easy to do so. So if you have a transducer like the one above, the domain of the transducer is just the same transducer where you remove the output, and the range is the same transducer where you remove the input. OK? So these are the, the, the domain of the function and the range. For symbolic transducers, the domain is easy. It's basically it's the same transducer where you remove the output. So it's, it is a symbolic automaton. The range is actually, and this is, there are two papers out there on symbolic transducers that actually make a mistake this. So there are two wrong theorems out there that they say that this is not the case. So be careful. This is the, the really the, the, the first pitfall of everybody working on symbolic transducer for the first time is not seeing that I created a dependence in the output. So the output of the transition forces a relation, a binary relation, between those two characters. So whenever I read a number greater than 5, I output that number and that number plus 1. So the output language has to remember that the second element is equal to the first element plus 1. If I don't do that, I'm missing something. So the output of a symbolic transducer it's actually an extended automaton, the one we saw before that reads multiple characters. And if you remember, what I told you is that symbolic extended automaton are bad, a bad model. They don't have good properties. In fact, using what I showed you before, you can immediately show that injectivity of transducers is undecided, of symbolic transducers is undecidable, a well-known decidable property for finite transducers. And it reduces almost straightforward to, the, to what we saw before, the intersection emptiness. So symbolic transducers are a tricky model. They can, you can think that they are very simple. They're not. In fact, the, you cannot use the trick I, I told you before where I finitize the alphabet because you have these dependencies, the output. So it's, it's not trivial. And so th there is lots of work on this. Um, so there is a paper by Margus and Aldi uh, on Thursday on the minimization which is very interesting. And then there is a lot of work. Again, it's, I, I can't cover everything, but it's, it's fairly prolific. Uh, uh, like lo lots of people now are working on this topic, not just me and, and Margus. So it's, it's quite interesting. So again, I showed you what they are. The really, the fun part is to see what you can do with them. So I have a lot of applications. Uh, I'm going to just cover a couple of them, but uh, I focus on the fun ones. So again, if you, if you were asleep up to now because I was showing you properties and stuff, it's a good time to wake up. As I say, there will be a video of me dancing, so hold on. Uh, so I will focus on two applications. Uh, actually, there is a typo there. I'm, I'm going to focus only on analysis of string encoders and uh, analysis of functional programs over trees. But really, there is, uh, there is a lot of interesting work out there. So I'm going to start with string encoders. So string encoders are a really interesting class of functions for two reasons. So first of all, uh, encoders and decoders are these functions that have a very important relation that needs to be checked, let's say. And this relation is that if I take an encoder that given an input text produces an output text, the decoder better retrieve the input text. So there is this property that they need to be inverse of each other. So this is what got us started. Like this seems like an important property that we should use static analysis for. We should be able to check whether this holds. And why is it an important property? Because my name contains a quote, an apostrophe. And uh, when I was in the job market last year, I would get emails like this one saying, dear Loris, the uh, weird encoding of the apostrophe, uh, we didn't, we, we, 
first of all, they did an, they, they rejected my application and they screwed up my name. So it was like the worst possible outcome. Um, so it was like, this is unacceptable. So I couldn't focus on, on being angry at them for not hiring me. So I had to focus on fixing the quote. And uh, so we started, I mean, we started this problem, but I mean, this wasn't the real reason, but this is a good story. Uh, but basically, this is a, a common mistake that uh, encoders are, are broken. And broken encoders, they can annoy the author of a paper, but they can also cause more serious problems. So in particular, if we go back to our cross-site scripting attack, encoders are used all the time to make sure that bad strings don't make it to the back end. And in this case, for example, on Stack Overflow, you can have your image be in uh, some URL on your web page. It's like, or my, my image is column.png here. But you can also add these quotes that if the backend doesn't escape, it doesn't remove, will actually cause, and this is a, a sort of SQL, it's like an SQL injection, but not quite. Basically, that on load will actually be executed. So you really have to make sure that the single quote is encoded to the corresponding HTML entity. So if you didn't understand this example, it's okay, but string encoders, they can cause security vulnerabilities. In fact, uh, encoders and sanitizers account in, uh, there was an OWASP report uh, a few years ago, and they were the, the second highest source of security vulnerabilities in the web. Okay. So long story short, one property we care about is that encoders are inverse of each other. So this is the definition of inverse. If I run the encoder and the decoder ba is back to back, I get what I started with. And similarly, if I run the decoder and the encoder back to back, I get what I started with. So I actually need both directions because I need to make sure that the two functions not only are inverses, but they also form a bijection. So meaning that the domain of the encoder is the range of the decoder and vice versa. There are actually certain functions for which this is not true, and one has to do slightly more modified things, but for now, let's assume everything is a bijection. So this is what an encoder looks like in our domain-specific language. This is also what it looks like in JavaScript implementations out there. It's fairly complicated, so it actually it looks like real code because it is real code. And, uh, and the interesting part is that there are lots of interesting things going on. So the first one is that we see bit vector manipulations. So classic automata problem. The second one is that there is this notion called extended pattern matching, which basically allows you to read multiple characters at a time. And the third one is that we have this tail recursion. So these are kind of recursive programs that produce output. So you can guess it, the right model to think about this was a form of transducers. And in fact, with Margus, we built this language called BEX that basically will take encoders and decoders in this DSL, transform them into the, some transducers, check using transducer composition and equivalence. I didn't talk about equivalence, but equivalence is sometimes decidable. Whether the, the two are inverse of each other, which means that the composition of the encoder and decoder yields back the identity. And then the decoder, and then say verify. Okay? Uh, so the model we use for this, actually, I'm gonna just show it because I'm gonna talk about it a bit more, but is, is this extended automata like we saw before, but with output. So it basically, we read a number of characters, in this case three, and we have a property, a, a n-ary predicate. In this case, this is actually, th this, is, this transition is the actual base64 encoder, a very used encoder. And uh, it checks that all the characters we read are bytes, and then outputs some function of, of those characters. So in this case, if you take MAD, this will output TWFK. Notice that there is a lot of bit vector operations, lots of crazy stuff. So it's really, it's not, it's not easy. So the paper we wrote with Margus, uh, we could actually verify these properties very efficiently actually. In one second, we could, the hardest encoder that is out there is this UTF uh, encoder and decoder and we could verify it fully in less than a second. So check that the two functions are bijections, the domain align correctly and so on. Um, and it, this was great. Uh, we were very happy about this. We wrote a few papers. And then last year with, with my student, we were like, essentially, this feels like we are doing the wrong work. So we are basically writing a program, writing its inverse, and then checking that they're inverses, 
why don't we just, even our encoder, synthesize a decoder that, inverse, that, that, that is the inverse? The inverse is functionally unique. There can be many syntactic ways to write it. But why don't we just synthesize the decoder from the encoder? And, uh, and this was an application that was entirely enabled by symbolic transducers. There was actually another paper about doing inversion that required the programmer to give hints to the, to the synthesizer. And instead, we were able to do it fully automatically without any intervention from the programmer. And let me show you why this was useful, why this was possible. So first of all, I'll show you that inverse is trivial for finite state transducer. So if I have that, that transducer, the inverse is just I flip the input and the output. This is easy. In the symbolic world, the inverse might not even exist. And let me show you why. So let's look at the inverse of a single transition. So if I have this transition that reads L characters and outputs some stuff, the inverse transition should read as many characters as were output by the first one. Make sure that it, it only reads inputs that are in the range of that function and then invert the transition, but only on the domain of the original transition. So suddenly, we, we pick a problem that was transducer problem, and we turn into a logical problem that has very interesting questions. So first one is, how do we get rid of that quantifier at the top? The second one, this is not a function. This is a specification. We need a function to build our transducer. So and the theorem, though, it was we proved that if, this, if your transducer is injective, inverting every transition will actually produce the inverse. So we went ahead and tried to do so. So for the, for the guard part, it turns out that for most of the theories we cared about, bit vectors and linear integer arithmetic, the theory admitted quantifier elimination. So we, we were able to get rid, of the, uh, get rid of the quantifier. But for this one, this was the hard problem. However, it was less of a hard problem than inverting the whole transducer itself. Basically, we were able, using symbolic transducers, to, to reduce the problem of inverting a function over strings to a function over of finite arity, a function that reads a finite, uh, three inputs and produces two outputs or something. And the solution was actually what Rajiv talked about this morning in, the, in David D's workshop. It was that thanks to this reduction via transducers, we were able to use an off-the-shelf synthesizer based on the syntax guided synthesis framework. So this framework is, allows you to basically define a context-free grammar of terms you allow in your synthesis language, a, a predicate that is the specification of what you want, and outputs a function satisfying your predicate. And here is trivial to do the reduction. Well, our context-free grammars is the set of terms in the alphabet theory. Our constraint is that the function should be inverse of what we have. So it's, it's a very nice to encode it. And in fact, we were able to go one step further, and we were able to prove that actually, if your theory admits inverse, which is a bit of a technical definition, but more or less it means that any function can be inverted, then this is actually sound and complete. Even though cycles in general is undecidable, this problem is decidable. So we actually built this tool, Genic, that lets you write an encoder, builds a transducer, uses a technique to check injectivity, if it's injective, inverts the transitions and gives you back the decoder. And is, it has a practical implementation. In fact, it's so practical that we use it to invert a lot of stuff. So we wrote, we wrote all these encoders. These, these are almost all the encoders humans care about for strings. Um, and we were able to invert. So these operate over the theories of bit vector arithmetic of various length. They have interesting sizes. Even in our domain-specific language is very succinct. And we still are at two kilobytes of code. So they are pretty big programs. We were able to check injectivity very quickly and to invert also very efficiently. Actually, you can invert all transitions in parallel. So we, we, in less than a minute, we invert all the encoders. And uh, the only one we couldn't invert was one transition of UTF-16 or UTF-8 because it's a very big function. But not only we were able to invert them efficiently, Actually, the, the programs we produce are uh, human readable. They're actually, they have the same size, more or less, of the manually written one. So uh, essentially, for this, prog for this problem, our technique could replace, uh, the could replace the human in the task of writing the, the, the inverse. OK. OK, 
Sounds good. So are, are there questions at this point? I, I, I still have a one set of applications, but I can take a few questions. Just want to make sure that at least 20% of you are not asleep. 10%, yes. Multiple outputs for a single transition. So that actually cannot happen because of the model. So you cannot have multiple outputs for a single transition, but you can have multiple outputs for the same input through different paths. Oh, that actually it's only one of the problems. It, that, uh, you mean for injectivity or for stuff like that? So yeah, injectivity is decidable if you have exactly one output on each transition. But even if you can delete, it's not necessarily, this, we don't know if it's decidable. But yeah, the, the reason why the output language is extended is because you can output multiple symbols. But, but that's also what makes the model interesting. You can't. That's what I showed before, because if you have given x, you output x, x. What problem is trivial, you're asking? It's unclear. Yes, something becomes, so the question is like, if instead of allowing to output multiple symbols, you allow something like a, a Moore machine where you only allow each symbol you read can only output exactly one symbol, does the theory become easier? The answer is yes. I don't know how easier. I mean, something becomes easier for sure because injectivity becomes decidable. The output language is again uh, this defined by a symbolic automaton, assuming your theory is quantified elimination. Uh, but I, yeah, I don't know on top of that. It, what I can tell you is not, it's not, it's not a very useful model though because those are called length preserving transduce transaction and there is a, a long literature about they can do stuff but not, not that much interesting stuff. Particularly all the applications I'm showing today that they, they don't fit in that model. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is the fun part of the talk where you see me dancing. Uh, so five more minutes and then you, you, can, you can make it to that point. So um, the last application we is basically we, we designed, uh, it kind of falls all in the same pattern. We designed an expressive transducer model, expressive automaton model, and then we, we built the programming language on top of it. So this language is called FAST. And here the, the, the model which I'm not gonna show is three transducers, which are kind of like the same as I showed before, but over trees. And uh, so FAST basically compiles the symbolic three transducers and exposes APIs like the following functions, which allow you to do function composition, uh, compute pre-image, operate over languages and assert pre-post. So this is type check is kind of pre-post, like I showed before. And uh, another interesting property of FAST is that you can generate efficient JavaScript C, C sharp code. So you can perform your analysis in the, inside the language and then generate code to run. So I will show you three applications. So one is uh, the one I started the talk with, so very fine HTML sanitizer. And then I will show you a, something called deforestation and then I will show you how to use uh, uh, three transducers to reason about augmented reality. So, augmented reality at CAL. You heard it right. Uh, so, all these applications that use infinite alphabets, data types, actually, FAST allows you to use data types. In fact, any data type supported by Z3. So, FAST is built on top of Z3. So, any theory that is Z3 definable, you can actually use it in the language. So, we saw what, what an HTML sanitizer looks like. And um, what are interesting questions that you might want to check for an HTML sanitizer? So remember the sanitizer is this thing that prevents bad code to reach the server. So one interesting question is like, we have a, by now we have a compiled set of known vulnerabilities, known things that should never make it to the backend. And we can just check, can my sanitizer produce any of those vulnerabilities? Another one we can check is, does it always produce HTML? because there are also vulnerabilities based on the fact that if you produce unfor HTML that is not well matched, the parsers in the backend can interpret it a different way and cause problems. 
or uh, is as defined on any possible HTML file, or sometimes it just gives up. So these are all security interesting, interesting security questions. I will show you an example of one. So this is actually what fast looks like. And uh, in this example, I, I wrote two functions. So one removes all the script nodes from a, from a tree. So it takes all this, all this JavaScript. The other one escapes all the quotes. So you, you don't have to understand that. But then in fast, you can basically compose them. And let's call that a sanitizer. And you can define the set of inputs, outputs that you don't want to produce. So for example, you can say a bad output is one that still contains a script. And of course, you can use Boolean operations to say a good output is one that doesn't contain a script. Like you can use complement. And then you can ask, is it true that for any HTML tree, I always produce a good output? So this is all within the language. So now I can run fast, and fast will say, hey, you have a bug. Uh, in particular here, what happened is that on, if, if I have a node with a script that has a nested node also with a script, I only produce, I only delete one of them. So basically, my output still contains a script. And this, if you go and debug the program, actually, this was inspired from an actual vulnerability. We forgot to invoke recursively the program on the children. So whenever we deleted the script, we stopped there. We didn't delete the children. We didn't recurse on the children. So if you fix this, you can actually rerun fast, and fast will tell you, yep, actually, this one is OK. This program satisfies the problem. So we did more on this. We actually showed that you can write a sanitizer that was fast in this way, because uh, you can, uh, after you have a transducer, you can build efficient code for it that runs in a single pass. So lots of cool stuff. Um, but let me show you another application. Uh, the other application is deforestation. So this deforestation was introduced by Phil Wadler in his, in his dissertation. And the idea of deforestation is that when you have a, when you, when you have a program, you have a composition of functional programs that operate over lists and trees. Sometimes you can throw away the composition and build a single program that runs both of them back to back. So basically, you, you use closure under composition. And the idea is like, for example, instead, let's say you have that input, a classic Haskell or OCaml implementation of this function will run the function once, will run it again on the output of the first function, and output. And instead, we want to just run in one shot from the input produce the second output. So deforestation basically uses fast as deforestation by, by default, because it just uses closure under composition to build this function. So notice that this is not trivial, because I'm doing actually composition at the predicate level. So this is actually checking that the predicate, when composing, the, the, this new predicate actually holds. And uh, when you run it in fast, what happens? It builds the transducer, it composes them. And then it uses, it generates C-sharp code. And this C-sharp code is actually very fast. So for example, here, if you use the classic camel implementation, you get that runtime. But in our case, you get basically this almost constant runtime. OK. Somebody's speaking on the phone, I guess. <laughs> OK. So finally, the last application is this, uh, applica this uh, use of fast in augmented reality. So I will show you two applications, actually. So one is very fine, these programs called taggers. Uh, so well, and I mean, augmented reality is this thing that is supposed to happen eventually. So I was told five years ago. And uh, it still doesn't happen, but some of us started worrying about us like, OK, if this happens, we will have to develop, develop some static analysis for augmented reality, whatever it means. So this actually is the whole reason I started working on this topic, by the way. Was to verify some crazy stuff. And then we, we went other directions, but this actually happened somehow. And, uh, and the two applications we were, we, actually, the application we were interested in is uh, very fine Kinect animations. And, uh, and then we also work on this tagger thing. So a tagger to start is a very simple program. It's just, this is actually the main application of augmented reality that is used on your phone, for example, is that you point your phone at something and it augments your screen with some random stuff. So like it puts a head, like Snapchat is an example. It, it makes, it's very important to have your cat ears, otherwise you cannot be annoying to your friends. And um, 
Essentially, that's a tagger. And taggers can actually be modeled because the internal representation of all these applications, and I mean, this is a bold claim, but most of them, they basically have an ontology of what they see. So they represent a tree that represents, like they say, oh, there is a, a table, and the table has two chairs attached to it, and so on. So because of that representation, it's very easy to represent them in, uh, in S3 transformations. And uh, essentially, the issue, what, what do you want to verify about, it, uh, about Snapchat? It's unclear. But there is a, a, a problem that can happen in practice, is that uh, you might have a non-malicious application. I mean, calling Amazon non-malicious is it's a bit of a stretch. But uh, that just wants you to buy a, a chair from Amazon.com. And uh, uh, you might have a mal another malicious application that can overlay a transparent tag on top of that button. And when you actually click, you think you're going on Amazon.com, but you're actually going on trollface.com. So we wanted to verify whether this could happen. So we defined a notion of interference, which was essentially that if a node is annotated multiple times, that's an interference. If I have two programs and they run them back to back, and now suddenly a chair has two tags annotated with it, that's bad. So this is oversimplistic. I'm simplifying a lot, but like, this was kind of the idea. And um, the idea is that we could model this as fast programs, and so we did. So the idea is like, I want to make sure that if I compose two taggers, they don't annotate the same node twice. And we basically generated a bunch of taggers by observing how these things were written. We wrote them in fast, and we, saw is that we show a proof of concept that this could actually be done, because we could perform very fast verification. And notice that these were actually very complicated, because, because of the nature of taggers, you have to reason about uh, screen placement. So we had, we had nonlinear constraints over the theory of reals to reason about that. And still, because everything is a Boolean algebra, we could do it. So the second application is, I'm not going to go too much into the detail of what you can do with it, but I'll just show you. This actually was literally my first week at Microsoft Research. The project I started working on was basically this. Of, they told me, oh, the Kinect skeleton is a tree. Use tree transducers for something. It's like, OK. And, um, my idea was that like, you could actually model transformations of the skeleton tree using a tree transducer. In particular here, you see that on the right, I, create, I have a new skeleton that open, open the legs. And this actually can really be, the, this actually, we, we have the code def defining this as a tree transducer. And um, I would say, why, why on earth would you do that? And I will show you, it's actually useful. But first, let me show you. I, I wrote, during my first week, actually, I wrote this application that I'll show you now, which basically was, it, it was a, a language for defining transformations, like sequence of moves. And, uh, and then we would compile to transducers, do it. And the idea was to perform some static analysis on this. Uh, and this is what the application does. I, I, I encoded the sequence of moves in language. And now I, I have to basically follow them up. And so this, this is the famous video of me dancing. And uh, every time I overlay, I match something. So where are the three transducers here? So first, whenever I, I create one of those animations, is a tree transduction. And whenever I actually match the skeleton with my skeleton, it's actually a tree transducer on the product tree. So uh, it was, as you say, OK, cool, but why did you do that? And the idea is that actually, after you have this, with this definition, you can verify questions about these sequences. So you can ask, is there an input that if I start in, will cause me to try to rotate my arm beyond the human limits. And uh, since these tools, especially on Kinect, they're used, for example, there are applications for yoga. There are actually now applications for uh, uh, more senior people doing gymnastic, gymnastics. You don't want them to sue you because you asked them to, to do the who knows what yoga move in, uh, in a way that will kill them. So actually, I, I did this. And then uh, uh, some people picked up on it and actually built a tool called FreePose that is patented. And uh, they showed, actually, that you could do a lot of interesting verification on top of it. So what's next for symbolic transducer? So I'm not going to show as much as before, but I want to just give an idea. So uh, interesting directions, uh, I, like, I think these days that one of the things that people care about the most is this vulnerability in JavaScript. So Google has a whole team that just does that. that. They just check that you don't write some terrible stuff in JavaScript. And really understanding how these things work, and strings play a big role there. So I think the symbolic transducers could be used there. And uh, something that Marcos is working on is just like 
the ugly thing of what I showed you is that every time I gave you domain-specific language for writing these transducers, and Margos is really trying to extract them directly from code. It's like, the, the claim is that lots of transducers are hidden out there. We just need to figure out a way to pull them out. Uh, and then, uh, actually, this is Roberto Giacobazzi and Mia della Fred are working on using symbolic transducers as an abstract transformer for symbolic automata and use them as an abstract domain. And uh, one of their, their applications that they, they, they're trying to pursue is reasoning about the reflection in JavaScript, where basically you, in, you interpret a string as code. So they're trying to, the transducer is supposed to, given the string, produce the AST, and then you can reason about that. So in conclusion, before I end, so uh, I'm, I'm at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, part of the MedPL group. And these are all the people in the MedPL group. We just hired Justin. He will start in one year. But we have a really nice group working on any problem that you can care about if you're in this audience. And uh, uh, if you have a student that wants to do a PhD or, or somebody that wants to do a postdoc in something related to these or any of those topics, make sure they apply to our program. And uh, it's really, I'm, I have the honor to work with really great people like Tom, Samesh, Ben, House, and Justin. So it's a really exciting place to be. Um, and uh, so now I can conclude. And so what are symbolic automata and transducers? So my claim is that they are a very versatile model for reasoning about trees and strings over complex alphabets. And uh, they, they subsume classic automata, so they're more expressive, more general, more succinct, but, uh, and introduce this very nice separation of concerns between worrying about the automaton structure and worrying about the structure of the alphabet. So I think this is really, it's, it's something I think I'm very proud of because it's, it really separates it makes you throw, solve certain problems as black box that is nice to treat them as black box. An example was the syntax guided synthesis. An example is just like the way we treat predicates. And it really this opens a whole new avenue for algorithmic design. Like just understanding how these predicates are treated, generating as few predicates as possible. It really something that in the classic automata theory wasn't there. And, and this is useful in practice. I, sh I hope I convince you that there are many practical applications for this. And uh, so these are actually, this is not comprehensive. Like I really, if you, if you liked any of this stuff uh, or if you didn't understand some of this stuff, so this web page at the bottom is where I, I have a, a list of all the papers on the topic, not just by me, also by other people. And I try to keep them in one place. So if you, if you really want to learn more about this, uh, there is lots of work. Lots of applications, lots of open source implementations to mess with. And uh, yeah, so you're welcome to help us. Thanks. here. Um, so the first question I had was about the extended uh, mm -hmm. automata. So uh, I was a little confused. So on the one hand, it seemed like they have very rough properties in terms of decidability, etc. Mm -hmm. On the other one, they, they do come up in, in, in several of the applications that you showed. So I, I want to understand this a little bit better. So first of all, um, th uh, as for the definition, so I guess the, the constant number of the number of characters uh, that each transition can read, that number is, is constant for a transition. It can dynamically change. It's constant for a transition, but for it can differ across transitions. Differ across the transitions, OK. I could imagine that that being a dynamic number, that obviously makes the problem worse, but that could still be interesting so that you have more like a stream, right, that can decide online how many characters it wants to read, maybe up to some, up to mm. some bound. Um, but given that it's a constant, so it means you can compute the maximum number of, uh, of strings that any transition can, uh, or, or symbols that any transition can read in the, in the uh, automaton, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't give you any power because uh, even, I, I guess, then some transitions, they might sort of waste certain uh, characters and then they're gone because there's no memory yeah. in these machines, right? So, well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it. This is multiple questions, but I think they're all very interesting. So the first, one of your questions was like, I can compute the max. I actually, I can, 
can you still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I, con I can't compute the max, and this is the example. I mean, for a single automaton, let's say I, I could do something. That's why emptiness is decidable, because it's just a path. But in this case, for example, the intersection emptiness, the reason I can't do it is because these two automata, they, they never synchronize on a finite length except the terminating output. Okay. Okay. So you, you are not able to actually, you cannot build the intersection because there is no finite look ahead that synchronizes them. Okay. So if all transitions have the same look ahead, then this is the same as normal automata. Okay. Uh, your other problem, it's actually something, when, when, so then you ask, they have ugly properties, so how do you use them in practice? So one thing we did was what I showed that if the predicates are Cartesian, you can actually reduce to normal automata, but you don't know a priori because this can appear in applications, so that's one thing we did. And another thing we did, we have some semi-decision procedures for certain cases. Okay. And your other question was actually a very interesting, uh, you, not only you can imagine it's useful, the one that you said, I can imagine that the, my, my look ahead is, is a function. So this is actually, it's a very real example is, that's what happens in uh, analysis of network packets, like TCP, because in TCP, what you do is that like, the very first thing you read in the input tells you how many characters you will read after that. And uh, so actually I thought about that for a while, we were trying to do a project on the topic, I had the decidability results for a class, and I never wrote it down, but in general you have to do hacky restrictions, it's, everything is ugly, so it's, that's, that's a long story short, but uh, it, it boils down to doing loop summarizations of some kind, yeah. I see, okay. And, and maybe if I may, so related to that, I guess you kind of already uh, hinted at that. So these uh, problems being undecidable, probably it's natural to think about um, approximation algorithms or partial algorithms that in some cases mm -hmm. compute the intersection and in other cases maybe they fail. Yeah, um, so I, I, we, we, we had our CAV, uh, our being essentially our FMST paper, has uh, some of these algorithms. I mean, one thing you can easily do is just start the algorithm and try to synchronize them. If you can, your algorithm terminates, otherwise you don't. Yeah. Uh, but it finding in cases in which you can actually do it algorithmically is interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, I think, for example, this whole proof relies on, on a specific theory, the theory of linear integer arithmetic, but if you only allow equality, then this does actually, you don't get the, the same. You, the problem becomes decidable at least because you, you have nominal automata. Okay. So th there is lots of I don't know. Uh, it, uh, one thing of this model, for example, is that if you have non-determinism, you are close under union, if you are, but you are not close under intersection and complement. Okay. If you have determinism, you are close under complement. Complement is actually uh, not at all a trivial proof, but you, you are close under complement based on your idea of computing this max look ahead, okay, but, not but not under union. So it's. Uh, okay. So there is some hope to develop a theory, but uh, uh, I don't know. I guess there is. Okay, cool. Okay, go ahead. So my question is educational a little bit. So given your experience with uh, symbolic automata, how would you teach the automata in your classes, for example? <laughs> so <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about the topic. So, um, so I do teach symbolic automata uh, in my graduate class on. Uh, on program verification and synthesis, and uh, especially I, I cover it actually as to, to explain how, how model checking really works, because in model checking, you really treat automata symbolically because you have these bit vectors. You never actually enumerate all bit vectors. Um, but uh, in an undergraduate class on complexity, on, on computability theory, it's unclear whether uh, at that point the students have the, I mean, already computability theory, I think, is, is the type of class that everybody in this audience thinks was the easiest class they took in, in undergrad, and everyone else in this room thought they were stupid. Uh, so it's like, it's one of these things that like, if you get it, it's trivial. If you don't, you're completely lost for, for a semester. So I don't know if putting first order theories there, it's, uh, it's the best one could do. But maybe for an advanced topics, if you have time, it's, uh, I think it's a very fun way to explain really how algorithms work. I, for me, really, this, this process were more of, was coming up with these papers was really, I, I didn't understand these classic algorithms until I could make them symbolic, and really, that made me think about what they were. Uh, the Hopcroft is, uh, is an example that, like, is, is a very simple algorithm to, uh, to, to write down, but to really explain why, understand why it works, it took me, I think, months 
And actually, I thought I understood it, and then we tried to do the by simulation work, and, I, I, and it was clear that we, we were still missing something, and we are still missing something. Um, does that already contain some of the ideas for the JavaScript, or is this, n is this uh, new stuff completely? So I, I, I haven't myself done work on uh, arbitrary JavaScript except, except work on sanitizers and, and encoders. There are other people working on basically uh, string equations with transducers. So Anthony Lini is one of these people. Uh, VJ and this, their group are building these SMT mm -hmm. solvers for sequences. So I think I, I, I implemented symbolic automata in Z3. So Z3 now supports uh, sequences to a certain extent. So everything you can write as the theory of strings, you can also write it as sequences, but not with transducers. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh, uh, some, something an excited, an excited student should, uh, should think about. Yeah. And by the way, I don't know if you mentioned that, uh, so there's also an invited paper yep. with this talk, which is probably, Victor, going to be in the proceedings also, right? So that everybody can yeah. read this in, in detail also at home. It's also on my page, and on the page I showed, is if, if you ever have, if you want to read just one paper about this topic, you should read the CAV invited paper. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have. Okay, any other questions? Um, if not, then I'd say we thank Lawrence once again for the